Thank you for the uh, kind introduction. And yes, uh, so I did my postdoc here many years ago, so uh, very excited to be back in Toronto. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak at uh, today's uh, wonderful uh, symposium. I was actually a bit worried I wasn't going to be able to make it when I boarded the airplane yesterday from Edmonton. Uh, the pilot said because of the weather in Toronto that we can't leave. Uh, luckily, about two hours later, we were given the go-ahead to take off so I could be here. Uh, and at least for uh, my presentation today, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, and I do like to do my talks a bit different. I like to start with my acknowledgements and highlight the trainees that do all the hard work. Uh, and so at least for today's presentation, some of the published findings I'm going to be presenting are the uh, work of a former uh, master student, Malak Amatairi, depicted in the top left. Uh, and the unpublished work I'm going to share with you today is the work of a recently graduated PhD student, Amanda Greenwell, who's actually joining Toronto next September as a medical student as well as a master student that joined the lab last year, Jordan Chan. And so there are three major learning objectives that I'd like to go over today. Um, and the first one really is to highlight the concept that in the early stages of type 2 diabetes, uh, it's really characterized by this diastolic dysfunction that's often diagnosed, which is a defining feature of diabetic cardiomyopathy. And so at least diabetic cardiomyopathy um, was a term first coined in the 1970s off some pathological findings uh, by Peter Ruber and colleagues. Uh, and it was given this um, definition, ventricular dysfunction in the absence of macrovascular cardiovascular disease in an individual diabetes. However, over the past 20, 25 years, we've made numerous advancements in our understanding of this pathology um, that it's actually been argued in a really nice review by Dale Abel and Rich, uh, Rebecca Ritchie a couple years back uh, that we perhaps re-term this pathology and perhaps refer to it as diabetic heart disease. And one of these defining features, as I've already mentioned, is diastolic dysfunction, uh, which is also uh, you know, a major characteristic of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HFPF. And so some of what I'll be talking about today is if we can target energetics to treat diastolic dysfunction and possibly delay or prevent progression of HFPEF, which is enriched in people with diabetes. And so diastolic dysfunction, at least the um, superior way to measure it is with cardiac MRI. However, that's not often as readily available as ultrasound echocardiography. Um, and there have been a number of advancements in echocardiography that have allowed this to be readily measured as well. Um, and so diastolic function can be assessed with pulsed wave Doppler to look at blood flow velocity during the early and late phase of relaxation or the E to A ratio. Or you can use tissue Doppler echocardiography to measure the adjacent tissue velocity during the early and late phase of, of relaxation. And this is the e, to, e prime to A prime ratio and at least in the context of diabetes, um, the diastolic dysfunction is reflected by a decrease in, these, uh, in the rate in the e, e to A ratio or the E prime to A prime ratio. And you could also combine the two, and an increase in the E to E prime ratio is reflective of diastolic dysfunction. And so in the bottom panel here, I just have some example data in humans with type 2 diabetes. You can see that the diabetic subjects have a decrease in their E to A ratio with the pulse wave Doppler and an increase in the E to E prime ratio. And so my lab is a basic science lab. We use preclinical models of um, obesity type 2 diabetes. And we're also able to assess this in, in our preclinical type 2 diabetes model. So our lab um, prefers, uh, at least our preference, is to use the combination of a high-fat uh, diet uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 weeks, which we combined with a low-dose injection of streptozotocin, STZ, uh, which is a beta cell toxin, and um, we do this uh, inter uh, injection at the four-week time point, and then usually the final anywhere from two to five weeks will um, usually intervene with a pharmacological therapy and use ultrasound echocardiography to see if we can reverse the diastolic dysfunction. And so at least for us, the reason why we, at least this is a cardiovascular audience here, so not the same audience that I sometimes talk to this about. Um, but when I talk with a diabetes audience, I'll often get asked, like, why are we also using this low-dose STZ 
uh, toxin. It does have other toxicities, off-target actions. Um, but at least for us, we like to use it in our lab because it really does give us a nice, consistent, reproducible diastolic dysfunction. And this here, just an example data with um, pulse wave Doppler, you can see the right panel is the type two diabetic mouse, and you see the uh, A wave increase, which contributes to the decrease in the E to A ratio. And so now for the second objective I'd like to go over is I'd like to just highlight now the metabolic phenotype of the heart in type two diabetes, and also highlight some contrasts with the uh, metabolic phenotype in heart failure. Uh, and then move on to the last objective in terms of targeting energetics. And so this illustration here is a very simplistic cartoon to highlight the last 20 years of work in the field that has demonstrated both in primarily preclinical models but also in humans uh, that the heart in someone with diabetes has a robust impairment in its ability to metabolize, oxidize, carbohydrates like glucose to generate energy ATP and rather gets the vast majority of its energy from the oxidation of fatty acids is depicted on the right side of the figure. Now this contrasts um, the metabolic phenotype in heart failure somewhat as in heart failure, if you read reviews or, or papers in the field, you'll often see that fatty acid oxidation is decreased. I'm not really gonna be talking about fatty acid oxidation today, but the discrepancy that, wanna, that I wanna highlight that actually may not be so discrepant is the statements and reviews of heart failure in humans will often state that glucose metabolism is increased. And, and that is technically correct. However, glucose metabolism is a combination of glucose uptake and glucose oxidation. And in heart failure, it's also been well characterized that there's insulin resistance at the level of the myocardium that um, glucose oxidation is also impaired and very similar uh, to what you see in, in, in diabetes. And so as an example here, uh, this is a canine model of heart failure involving rapid pacing of the left ventricle to cause a dilated cardiomyopathy. And the bottom right panel is glucose metabolism. The white bars are your heart failure canines. And so the left part of that panel is glucose uptake, which you see is increased and the right panel is glucose oxidation, which looks like an equivalent increase, but the scales are vastly different, and the reality is the fraction of glucose, the increased glucose uptake that is seen in the heart and heart failure, a lower portion of it is actually oxidized for energy. And this is more nicely highlighted in a study about 10 years ago from Gary Lopez Chuck's lab, where he used an aortic constriction in mice to cause a hypertrophy and heart failure, and you can see in the healthy mice that didn't get the aortic constriction, insulin is able to nicely stimulate glucose oxidation, and in the mice that had the aortic constriction, this is diminished. And so for the final portion of my presentation in the third objective, what I'd really like to discuss is, can we target this decrease in glucose oxidation to alleviate diastolic dysfunction and may this actually be a strategy to delay HFPEF, which is enriched in people with, with type 2 diabetes. And so I'm going to change gears now and discuss an actual therapy for type 2 diabetes um, that many of you may be familiar with due to the role Toronto has had in advancing incretin-based therapies for type 2 diabetes. And so that's the GLP-1 receptor agonist depicted on the top right, that is liraglutide, or what some of you may know as Victoza. It's a long-acting agonist of GLP-1. And so GLP-1 acts on its receptor in the islet beta cells of the pancreas to promote insulin secretion and thereby lower blood sugar levels in people with diabetes. And as I've already highlighted, insulin is a potent stimulator of myocardial glucose oxidation. So we've been interested in this angle that perhaps this therapy can increase glucose oxidation uh, in, in people with diabetes. There's also the possibility that these actions could be directly on the heart Though you can see in my illustration, I would argue that indirect uh, direct actions are not involved. And that's based on recent findings over the last five, 10 years, suggesting uh, that the cardiomyocytes of the heart do not express a GLP-1 receptor. And so to address this, um, Malak in my lab performed a very simple experiment where we extracted and perfused the heart in the isolated working mode and directly treated the heart with liraglutide 
and measured glucose metabolism. And what she observed, the green bars are the loraglutide treated hearts. There was no effect on either glycolysis rates on the left or glucose oxidation rates on the right, consistent with no GLP-1 receptor in ventricular cardiomyocytes. Conversely, she then performed an experiment where we first treated the mouse with loraglutide and then we removed the heart to perfuse it in the working mode and measure energy metabolism. And in this setting, what we now see is that while there's no change in glycolysis, if you look on the right panel, the blue bars are the loraglutide treated mice, you see a robust increase in glucose oxidation rates. And this metabolic um, change is preserved in mice that have type 2 diabetes. The rates are overall lower because of the insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes, but loraglutide is able to increase glucose oxidation in type 2 diabetic mice, likely due to an increase in insulin secretion. And I don't want to bore people with metabolic pathways in biochemistry at today's symposium, but I do want to just highlight one metabolic pathway here to then sh uh, show you in the next couple of slides how we kind of confirm that this increase in glucose oxidation may contribute to improvements in diastolic dysfunction in type 2 diabetes. And so PDH, or pyruvate dehydrogenase, is the quintessential enzyme required to oxidize glucose. And so if you don't have this enzyme, you can't oxidize carbohydrates. And so we created a mouse model in the lab where we actually removed this enzyme specifically in the heart. And we decided to perform studies in our mouse model of diabetes in these mice and their uh, control litter mates. And so the blue bars are the normal mice with type 2 diabetes. And if we treat them with loraglutide, these parameters of diastolic dysfunction that I highlighted earlier, uh, you see get reversed. So we have an increase in the E prime to A prime ratio, and we have a decrease in the E to E prime ratio, uh, suggesting an improvement in diastolic dysfunction. However, the red bars are the mice that don't have the enzyme PDH in their hearts, so they can't oxidize glucose. And loraglutide treatment in these mice with type 2 diabetes, you see has absolutely no effect on its ability to improve diastolic uh, dysfunction. However, as a glucose lowering therapy, you can see that loraglutide in both the normal mice and the mice that can't oxidize glucose in the heart, you're still able to get glucose lowering. So loraglutide can still act as an anti-diabetic therapy in terms of blood sugar, it just can't improve diastolic dysfunction. And so for us, we're excited by these findings, and, and many of you may be aware that GLP-1 receptor agonists like loraglutide in the LEADER trial has been shown to improve cardiovascular outcomes in, in diabetic subjects. Other GLP-1 receptor agonists like semaglutide and sustain 6 albiglutide in harmony outcomes, and dilaglutide in uh, the Rewind trial all improve cardiovascular outcomes. These subjects are a lot more, they have more significant cardiovascular disease than what we see in our model. But GLP-1 receptor agonists are actually very effective in early stage type 2 diabetes um, because these individuals still have uh, good beta cell function. And so we'd argue that this might be uh, an effective way to treat diastolic dysfunction, possibly delay half PEF. And we actually think we're excited. We think this is translationally relevant. Um, the field, for many years, there hasn't been a good way to measure glucose oxidation in, P in humans. Um, it's very easy to do in, in animals. However, um, there's been a number of advancements in cardiac MRS. Um, Dr. Kim Connolly at St. Mike's Hospital here in Toronto has actually been one of the pioneers of this technology. And so I just want to highlight here that the bottom right is diabetic subjects, and they have reductions in glucose oxidation with this technology. So I think it'd be cool to see with loraglutide if we could reverse that in humans with diabetes. And so just to quickly summarize and end my talk, because I do see the time is running out, People with type 2 diabetes are characterized by diastolic dysfunction and low glucose oxidation rates. This can be improved with loraglutide or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And so we think strategies to increase glucose oxidation or target PDH might be a novel therapy for both type 2 diabetes and possibly half PEF. And then finally, just like to, again to acknowledge the trainees who did this work, Malak al Matairi, Jordan Chan, Amanda Greenwell, all our many collaborators and the funding sources that supported this work. Uh, thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions uh, when we actually have the discussion uh, after the next two speakers. Thank you.